You know, Father's Day is that day we gather to give thanks to God for our earthly dads and to give thanks to those who've raised us and loved us. My sister sent me a, such an encouraging text message this morning about being a dad and a granddad, and I was so happy to receive that because the first thing I thought about was how I wish I could call my dad and call Becky's dad today, call our grandfathers and say thank you. And I'm deeply, deeply blessed for the amazing legacy and heritage of faith that I have. I'm third generation in our family of serving the Lord. I'm third generation in call to ministry. I'm first on my father's side of the family to be called into the ministry and first on my father's side of the family to go to college as well. My dad had a scholarship to college full-paid scholarship to a little university called Bob Jones University in South Carolina. And he turned down because my grandfather had died, and he took care of and ran the farm, paid the farm off for my grandmother, and gave up his college education, and then raised uh, and loved and taught a disabled son how to be a man. And I will always, always be grateful to my dad. I learned some things from my father about successful people. I learned some things from my dad about what successful people really know. My dad's father died when he was six years old. It left him with a mortgaged farm. He had lost seven farms during the Great Depression. It left him with a mortgage farm that he managed to save his mortgage to the hilt for my grandmother then to raise seven children upon. And they all, the oldest ones, fled as quickly as they could get away from the farm. Not because they were bad people, it's just not what they wanted, but my dad stayed and not only farmed the land, but farmed other people's lands, took care of a disabled brother of his own, and took care of his mother until she died. Oftentimes, people come to me, and they say to me, you came from a Christian family, you don't know what a blessing, you don't know what a heritage you have, and I let them talk because I know there's always something coming along behind that. And then they tell me about the horrible story of their childhood. They tell me about their dysfunctional family. They tell me about the kind of start they had in life. And my heart breaks for them, and I understand, and I listen with sympathy. My wife's father grew up in an orphanage. He was sent to be adopted by a family. He was sent by train, got off the train. They looked at him and says, you're not what we want. Put him back on the train and send him back to the orphanage. And there's where he grew up, and then later in the providence of God, met my wife's mother and married her. I think all of us, if we're just really frank, I think all of us in here can tell stories about coming from a discouraging start in life. I think all of us could stand up in here and say, I had a discouraging start in my life. I didn't come from a successful family. I didn't come from a healthy family. I think all of us have had at least some of us in this room have had a discouraging start in life. Would you agree with that? And I think there are many of us, and I know there are, because I've talked with you and I pray with you on many different occasions. There's an amazing story that's hidden in the Bible, and it's remarkable. It's one of those stories you kind of have to dig out. And it's the story of a man named Asher. Asher was the eighth son of his father, Jacob. Asher was born in northern Syria. Asher was not even the son of his mother. Asher was the son of his mother's servant that she gave to Jacob so that Jacob could have some more children by. And so when Asher was born, Zilpah gave her back to to Leah to raise. And Leah wasn't even his favorite wife. His name means happy. It's the kind of thing that you think about, and I have a very good friend who is a rabbi in the northern suburbs of Detroit that we talk frequently together. His name is Asher, and I pray for Asher, and I pray, Lord, bless him with happiness, bless him with joy. But I'm not so sure that Asher would agree that he had a happy start in life Because Asher, if he ever came, if you went through the book of Genesis with me, if you've ever seen a dysfunctional family, it was the family of Jacob. That was one messed up family. And so Asher, like some of us, had a very discouraging start in life. The Bible says this, Leah named him Asher for she said, what joy is mine, now the other women will celebrate with me. 
Let's read that together. What joy is mine, now the other women will celebrate with me. Let's, let's say that again. What joy is mine, now the other women will celebrate with me. But it doesn't seem like Asher's early life was much of a celebration. He lived in the shadow of his big brothers. His, home, his oldest brother was by the name of Reuben. His strongest brother was by the name of Judah. His most doted upon brother was the baby brother. How many of you are the babies in your family? Could I see your hand this morning? Some of us were talking this week. Is it true that the babies of the family are spoiled? Let me hear from the babies. Is it true that the babies of the families are spoiled? Can I say yes or no? Oh, yeah. How many of you that had a baby brother or sister you would say, yeah, they were spoiled? Can I hear an amen on that one? <laughs> That's been an interesting conversation for me to have this week. The favorite brother was Joseph. And actually, Asher kind of had to learn how to be content with the leftovers in life. Being the only son, being the firstborn son, I never really had to deal with leftovers. But I saw my sisters as they passed things along with each other, clothes and blouses and shoes, and I was always thankful I didn't have to do that. Asher had to grow up with parental favoritism. He had to grow up with, with brothers that fought with each other, that wanted predominance in the family. Asher had to grow up in a family that was full of deceit. Imagine not being able to trust your brothers and sisters. And some of you in here, you know what I'm talking about. Imagine growing up in a family where there's long-standing resentment. And as I thought about that, I went back and I looked through all the Father's Day messages that I preached at Woodland. This is my 24th Father's Day message to preach here. One of the messages that I preached to you years ago, I said, there's hardly a family in the Bible that you can emulate. There's hardly a family in the Bible that you can look at and say, that's what I want my family to be like. It's one of the ways that we know the Bible is the authentic word of God because it doesn't gloss over the problems in life and glamorize the heroes of the Bible. It lets us see them as they really are. Adam and Eve, after they sinned, got kicked out of the garden. One of their sons murdered the other son. Noah, after the flooding of the world, and he, the ark came and settled, God blessed his family. He planted a vineyard. He got drunk, and his brothers came up with a strategy to, to cover up his father's shame, his nakedness, because he got so drunk, he stripped down to nothing. One brother made fun of him. Two brothers came up with a way to cover their father's shame. We learn a lot from that story. There are people that just can't hardly wait to broadcast your failures and your shame, and then there are other people who try to protect you from it. And of course, we all want to be those who try to protect others. Jesse's sons, David's brothers, King David's brothers, they were fierce, proud, fighting men. They were loyal to their nation. They were the kind of sons that every nation hopes that fathers and mothers raise that will love their nation, be patriotic. But they were cruel to their brother David, and they mocked him. David, who became Israel's greatest king, was a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. David was a failure as a father. He couldn't manage his own family. He could manage a nation, but he couldn't manage a family. And then when you get to the New Testament, even Jesus' family. Jesus is fulfilling his role of being Messiah. He's preaching the gospel. He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. And his mother and his brothers, even Mary, for a period of time, had thought he's lost his ever-loving mind. And as they showed up in Mark chapter 3, and they tried to convince him to go home, you're crazy. And so I say all of that to say to my friends who, like my father, like Becky's father, like many good dads in this church, many good women in this church, that maybe you didn't come from the most healthy families. You came from a dysfunctional family. We can learn a lot if we look at some of the people who came from dysfunctional families and we see how they succeeded that's why I want to look at Asher this morning. I don't want to excuse anything Asher did. Asher joined his brothers in a selfish, deceitful, harmful, terrible scheme. Those of you that, again, you went through the book of Genesis with me, you know what I'm talking about. He and his brothers conspired to, to throw his brother Joseph into, a, into a, a deep well, a dry well, 
and then sold him into slavery and he ended up going to Egypt where he was betrayed in Egypt. He was tossed into prison and eventually became the second in command in the nation of Egypt. We could look at Joseph this morning, but I want to look at Asher. Because Asher is one of those people that often overlooked, but the more I've looked at his life because of one New Testament character, the more I've gone, wow, there's somebody I can really learn from. Years later, Asher, along with his brothers, was absolutely petrified with fear. You remember the story. They come in, they're sent by their father to buy grain because Palestine or Galilee, Israel, that area is going through a drought. So they go to Egypt to buy grain and to get oil and things to eat. And when they arrive there, guess who they're called in to see? They're called in to see their brother. They don't realize it's his brother. Through an elaborate scheme, finally Joseph reveals himself to him. And they are fearful for their lives, for they are sure that Joseph is going to do what every normal person would do. He's going to either imprison them or kill them. But instead, Joseph does something amazing. He blesses them, he prospers them, he forgives them, and restores them. This had to have a positive impact on Asher's life. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, before I answer that question, I want every one of you to look at me. I want those of you watching online today to look at me carefully in the eyes right now. Every one of us have the potential to change if we will allow Christ to be the Lord of our life. Every one of us have the potential to become what God wants us to be. You have the potential to become what God created you to be. Don't think for one moment you're an accident. Don't buy into the lies of of theories and evolutions that somehow or another by chance that everything that perfectly made this world possible for life to exist. If the, gener- if the universe was any bigger, life couldn't exist. If the universe was any smaller, life couldn't exist. And all the elements that show up here that make it possible for life to be upon this planet, everyone who really knows, knows that there was a divine creator, there was a divine designer, God created this world, and God God created you in his image. You are not in the image of some protoplasm or some animal. You are a man or a woman of God. He loves you. He sent his son to save you. And that's why this Father's Day, we want to look at someone who really, really did change. I'm not sure what happened, but something, I believe, began to shift in Asher's life after his encounter with Joseph. Haven't you had those kind of people that have come into your life They've had such a positive encounter upon your life. Rick, you brought positive change into my life. I hope that I brought some, I know that I brought some, maybe not positive, but into your life as well. Corey has brought positive change. Mark has brought positive change. Our board has brought positive change in my life. You meet people who have an impact upon you. That's why it's so important that we choose who we hang out with carefully. I'll never know, and you'll never know for sure what brought about his transformation, but these are some things that we learn from Asher's legacy. And more than ever, more than ever, and maybe it's because I'm getting older, but more than ever, I think about my legacy. My grandsons, Becky bought a small pool for them this week. It was so hot, and I'd go out in the backyard, and this has been one of those really, really demanding weeks, things that you were not expecting to take place. And so I'd go out in the backyard, and I'd be playing with the boys, and things would come to my mind. I needed to do. I need to do this. I need to do that. And there would be Davin in the pool holding up a green inner tube, and I was supposed to toss a, a, a Frisbee through. and says, Papa, we're going through cookies and cream land now. Papa, we're going through chocolate ice cream land now. Papa, we're going... And all these things, and I realized I'm building a legacy by just simply flipping a Lego back and forth with, with Davin while he's in the pool. Nolan comes out, and he says, Papa, look at the pool noodles, and look at this little... He built a tank like his father used to command, and he's shooting the water out of the cannons, and I'm thinking I need to do this, and when I wrote in my journal later that night, it's amazing how I can get distracted by unimportant things when the most important thing is in my life that makes a transformation. You see, the important things are the things generally that we have just a small amount of time to deal with. Legacy matters. 
I think about what's going to happen to Becky and to my children, my grandchildren, when I do die and when I go to heaven. Legacy matters because legacy is a reflection. Listen, legacy is a reflection of the transformation that Christ has made in our lives. And somehow or another, that gets more important to us as we get older. We know that Asher demonstrated things like wisdom and faith and character. We know that he demonstrated service to his nation. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? First of all, we know that when he went to Egypt, he was the father. Listen, the sons of, uh, sons of Asher were Imna, Ishva, Ishvai, Barakai, and their sister was Sarah. Not Sarah like his grandmother, or like his grandmother, but Sarah. Now, listen, this is why Sarah is so important. Of Asher's 53, 58 grandsons, she's the only granddaughter that gets mentioned in his legacy. 58 grandsons, she's the only granddaughter, Jacob's granddaughter. She's the only, Asher's daughter, his, Jacob's granddaughter, is the only one to get listed in this legacy. And it's so important that we understand that in a day of patriarchy, only sons got mentioned. But somehow or another, Sarah must have been very, very special to Asher. We don't know this from the Bible, but we do know this from Jewish history books. Asher married an Egyptian widow. Asher married her. She had a three-year-old, step, three-year-old daughter that became Asher's stepdaughter. And somehow or another, Asher must have loved her, welcomed her into her family, and she became such an asset and such an influence even to her grandfather that in their legacy she is lynched, she's mentioned. For some reason, she could not be left out. And I think the reason is because here was a man with a blended family that realized and learned from his mistakes after he was forgiven by Joseph. Isn't it amazing what happens to us when we experience the power of forgiveness? You see, the way you know some people are really forgiven of their sins is they're quick to forgive the sins of others. The way you know some people are still struggling with this whole process of regeneration is when it's difficult for them to forgive others. They hold on to memories. They hold on to things. They become bitter about it. They never let it go. But those that have been really forgiven, Jesus even speaks about this when he says, those that have been forgiven of much They forgive much, they love much. Those who think they've been forgiven of little, and that's our mistake because we think all of us are good enough to go to heaven. And yet the communion we took this morning says that none of us are good enough to go to heaven, and only through the saving blood of Jesus Christ will we ever have a hope of making it to heaven. And the people who really understand are the people who understand how great our sin was in the eyes of God, that he would give his only son, Jesus. So when I think about Asher... I see that somehow or another, Asher's life really changed. Because when his father was dying, Jacob called all 12 of his sons to his bedside. And there he had a word he wanted to give to each of them. There he had a blessing. And now listen, some of those blessings were not so kind. Some of those blessings, as we read through them and studied them, we looked at them and it was like, wow, wow. That is not the kind of memory I want to leave my father with. That is not the kind of memory I want to leave my mother with. And yet, when, Joseph, when Jacob gets to Asher's life, listen to what he says to Asher. Eighth son, son of a slave, son that was looked over, and he gives this very unique blessing. Asher will dine on rich foods and produce food fit for kings. Would you read that with me? Asher will dine on rich foods and produce food fit for kings. Now, you've got to remember, again, if you went through the series on blessing, if you went through the series on Genesis, blessing carries power. There's power in blessing. As a matter of fact, there are several books written that I have recommended to you before, but The Power of Blessing by a, a, a renowned Christian psychologist it still remains one of the best sellers in the nation. Those words carry power with them. And what, ja- what Jacob is doing is not saying, son, you're going to be a good chef. You're not going to go to schoolcraft and learn how to cook an oxtail and then learn how to make these beautiful dinners to go on somebody's, some king's table. He's telling him that you're going to be successful in life. I see something in your life. God has shown me something in your life. Asher, you have changed. Forgiveness has worked in your life. So if you fast forward 400 years, because we're running out of time here this morning, if you fast forward 400 years, you begin to see the legacy of Asher's life. 
His tribe is very much alive. Moses is preparing to die. But before he does, he goes through a blessing for each of the tribes of Israel. And he does something again that's against custom. He calls Asher in last. He calls the tribe of Asher in at the very last of his blessings. And he pronounces a very unusual blessing upon Asher. He says, may Asher be blessed above other sons. May he be esteemed by his brothers. And may he bathe his feet in olive oil. And again, this is kind of difficult for us to look at today and understand. But let me try to break it out quickly for you. It's an amazing blessing. It's one about Asher's legacy. It's an amazing blessing because of someone who came from a dysfunctional family with a very discouraging start in life, not a very stellar start in life, some big failures in life, and yet eventually became successful. It's an especially reminder to me as a dad that I simply can't measure the impact of my life by the years I live upon this earth. It is measured in the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and the descendants that will follow you and me. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise for that today. It's the reason, though, I love to read presidential biographies, autobiographies that they write. The real stories of their lives won't be written for another hundred years from now when we look at the effects of the decisions that they've had. May Asher be blessed above other sons, may he be esteemed by his brothers. To be esteemed means that his brothers approve of him, his brothers take delight in him, his brothers love to see him. Asher would be loved by his brothers. And the Bible talks a lot about the sons and daughters of God being blessed. And yet today, the latest research I've been able to find shows that 45% of us have strife and division with our siblings. 45% of us find ourselves still in a struggle like Asher's brothers had when they were younger. Secondly, he says, may he bathe his feet in olive oil. Now, you wonder, what does that mean? Well, only the wealthy people, everybody had to have their feet washed because you walked on dusty roads where animals defecated all the time and you needed your feet cleaned when you came in. It's kind of like living in Michigan in the wintertime. You walk into somebody's house, you just simply, by politeness, you take off your shoes, you put on socks, and so you walk around so that you don't track in the snow and the ice. Well, only the wealthy, because feet got sore, feet got blisters, only the wealthy could afford to have their feet bathed in olive oil because olive oil healed and soothed. And so when he's pronouncing this blessing, he's saying to you and to me that there's this constant need in our lives. Listen, there's this constant need in our lives for us to be bathed and for us to be soothed. That's why we prayed like we did over the bread this morning, that God would bring healing into our lives. There's this constant need that you and I have for blessings of other people in our life. I need blessings, but I also need to be a blessing. It's why when you gave this morning, you were giving out of the abundance of the olive oil that God has blessed you. As a matter of fact, we know that olive oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's what we use to anoint the sick around here to pray with. If we get desperate and we can't find it, we will use a little Wesson oil once in a while, but we do our best to keep olive oil here at the church because it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And occasionally I will be ready to preach a sermon on Sunday morning and I'll say to Becky, you know what? I believe the Holy Spirit has really directed me differently today. I'm going to put that one back in oil. What I'm saying is I'm putting that back in and the Holy Spirit. We used to sing a song, let the oil of heaven flow over my soul. It was a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And when you were born again, when you were regenerated, the Holy Spirit moved into your heart. You have the oil of the Spirit of God dwelling in you this morning. Can we give him a hand of praise for that? Every single day, Every single day, I want to dip my feet in that oil. Every single day, I want my soul bathed in that oil. And only the wealthy can afford that because only the king's kids get the presence of the Holy Spirit living inside of them. And you're a child. You're a son and a daughter of the king. So what does this tell me? Number one, it tells me that God will prosper those who trust him. I alone know the plans I have for you, plans to bring you prosperity, not disaster, plans to bring about the future you hope for. Is that not a good word for us this morning on Father's Day? God wants to bless and prosper your life. God is the one that gives us a posterity that we can be grateful for. I am writing to Timothy, my true son in the faith. 
Paul had no children of his own, but throughout the Bible, he talks, the New Testament, he talks about his sons of faith. He talks about his children of faith and how he's blessed by them. And you and I can have children of faith as we lead them to Christ and as we disciple them. I not only have my sons and my daughters, but those that have contacted me through the years this week to say, Pastor, I hope you have a wonderful Father's Day. They're sons and daughters of faith, and all of them have that legacy, that posterity. God will give us esteem when people's lives please the Lord. Even their enemies are at peace with them. Brothers who were at, in, with, were, were at enmity with one another suddenly loved Asher. And even Jacob recognized the change that God had made in his life. But to every single one of us, God gives the opportunity to make a fresh start in life, even if your life was like Asher's life. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you. Now stop. Because some of you, you think you're so good. Your mama always told you you were good. She'd squeeze your cheek and tell you you were so good. You were precious. You were beautiful. And she never told you about your sins that separated you from God. And then one day, the amazing power of the Holy Spirit convicted you. And you go, I'm not precious. I'm not good. I'm lost in my sin. What am I going to do? Woe is me. And suddenly Jesus shows up in your life and he offers you forgiveness. And you realize the truth of this statement, how patient, how good, how kind, how tolerant God was to me. Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from sin? Can we give him another hand of praise this morning? Hallelujah. Sin is a big deal. And when we mock it and say it's not, it's like telling somebody that cigarettes aren't bad for your body. It's like telling somebody that drugs aren't bad for you, except sin has eternal consequences and only God can cure that. But then Jacob and Moses both tell Asher something that you and I need to know. Despite all these blessings, we will be challenged. We will be challenged every day. Not only will you be challenged, but your legacy will be challenged. I teach my sons, you're going to be challenged. I still ask them about the challenges in their life. What can I pray with you about? What can I help you with? I want to be there. I, I want to be able to. And so when they ask me questions or when we pray together, it means so much because I know that my legacy is going to be challenged. And I look forward, if Jesus lets me live long enough, to having those conversations with my four grandsons. The bolts of your gate... Moses goes on, and you remember me reading this, may the bolts of your gates be of iron and bronze, and may you be secure all your days. I've never seen a day. I've never seen a day like we're living in now when the enemy is making such a bid for our children, for our kindergartners, for the lives of their minds, for the academic curricula that is no longer just about reading, writing, and arithmetic to learn to help them think, but trying to socialize and make them what the government and a current trend thinks is, is good and healthy that has never been good, never been healthy for any nation, any economy, not only for it comes to sexuality, but finances, but now we find ourselves being challenged in our very own homes. We find preachers being challenged about what they can preach and legislation that if, if we call sin, sin, even in the church that we could be prosecuted for hate speech. You will be challenged today. And just because you may be old and thinking like Hezekiah, well, it won't happen in my lifetime. Your legacy matters to God this morning. And the success and the impact of my life is not measured by the days that Becky and I live. It's measured by the posterity that we leave behind. And that's what God wants every father and every grandfather and every woman to know in this church today. You say, Pastor, how am I going to face it if that time comes? I think the wisdom that Corey Ten Boom's father shared with her, when it became obvious that they could become martyrs for Christ, Corey looked at her dad, who was just a simple watchmaker, but a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. And she says, Father, I'm afraid I won't have the strength to actually die for Jesus. I'm afraid that I won't have the courage to actually not renounce Christ under the reins of the Nazis. Corey's father looked at her and says, Corey, when I put you on the train from Harlan to Antwerp, 
do I give you the money two weeks ahead of time? She says, no, Father. She says, he says, when do I give you the money? The morning I board the train. He says, Corey, when that time comes, if it comes, God will give you the strength to face dying for his glory and honor. And of course, Corey survived the concentration camps. And what a blessing she was. Her life continues to be as a legacy to all of us. God will provide you strength in that time. So here's some lessons, Dad, that I take from after. Number one, dads are practical. Dads are just practical. Can I say something in here this morning? Dad, can I give you just a little bit of confidence? You're smart. You're smarter than your teenagers. You're smarter than your smart aleck teenagers. You're smarter than your teenagers that know how to key up a computer or an iPad and you don't. That's not wisdom. That's just some kid that went to YouTube that learned how to do it, and you don't have the time to do it because you're paying for all of his stuff. <laughs> you're practical. You're smart. Don't be intimidated by your kids. And especially what you allow when they're little is what you're going to have to put up with when they're older. <laughs> So dads, be purposeful in how you raise your children. But dads, be patient with how you raise your children. Dads, be present with your children. And that's what I learned from a green donut and flipping a Frisbee this weekend with my kids and thinking chocolate cookie land and milk and honey land and stuff in that. There's like, I've got important things to do. The most important thing was looking at me right in the face while his father is overseas serving our nation. Posterity. Dads promote. Dads build up their kids. And dads provide. Dads provide. Asher was a man that had a great start in life. But Asher changed, I believe, because of forgiveness. And Asher left a posterity. But I want to leave you one more thing before we pray. As a matter of fact, go ahead and stand with me because I know my time is up. But when Jesus was born... There's another little tidbit about Asher in the Bible. When Jesus was born, and on the day it came time for him to be dedicated to the Lord and circumcised, his parents, Mary and Joseph, bought him into the temple. There, there was an old man named Simeon, but there was also an old woman that had been a widow for years. And she recognized who Jesus was. Somehow or another, the Holy Spirit helped her to see who this incredible baby was, this virgin-born baby. And she said to Mary, this child is going to be the salvation of the whole world. And she blessed him. She prayed over him. But then the Bible gives us a little tidbit. She was a great, 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 great granddaughter of a man named Asher. What a happy moment that must have been for her to hold the Prince of Peace, the joy of the world, the happiness that Christ brings to all of us when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me and let me pray with you this morning. I thank you, O oh Holy Father, that the key to success in life is not well-connected families, it's not wealthy families, it's not even healthy families, Lord, but the key to success is the power of forgiveness. It's what happens to us, Lord, when our sins are forgiven and we recognize how kind and tolerant you've been towards us and we can extend that forgiveness to others. And as we bless others, Lord, you bless us and they in turn bless us. As a matter of fact, you bless us so much that you cause even our enemies to be at peace with us. So I pray on this day that every single one of us as we've watched these children be baptized this morning who've recognized as teenagers, Lord, 
I need the saving grace of Jesus Christ. May we be wise enough to admit our need of Jesus. And would you give us a fresh start, a purposeful start, and help us to live successful lives for your glory and honor. And while every head is bowed this morning, if you came from, no one's looking around, no one's moving, thank you so much. No one looking around. Thank you. If you came from a dysfunctional family or you didn't get a healthy start in life, would you slip up your hand this morning? Just hold it up high. There you go. All over the building. Would you put your hand down? Father, I pray in a special blessing upon these. They'll neither be hindered or shackled or held back. I pray in the name of Jesus that just as you have forgiven and cleansed them of their sins, you will propel them forward through the power of faith in your name to leave a legacy, Father, of godliness, of courage, of kindness, of forgiveness, but above all of love. And now, Lord, I pray for those that may have never crossed the line and given their hearts to you, or maybe, Lord, they've wandered from their faith. Maybe they've strayed from their faith. Would you convict them this morning? And would you bring them back to you? And if that's you and you'd like to pray with me this morning, either online or here at this church, would you just slip up your hand to commit or recommit your life to Jesus Christ? Say, Pastor, pray for me this morning. I want to recommit my life to Christ. God bless you. God bless you. If someone else, you say, Pastor, I need to give my heart to Jesus. Would you lift it up? Thank you. Let's pray together right now. Jesus, to everyone who comes to you, this was your promise. You would never cast them aside, but you would welcome them in. And you would give them the power to become sons and daughters of God. So right now, as I lead them in this simple prayer, help them to pray with faith and trust in your holy name. And if that's you, just pray this quietly. You don't have to pray it out loud. You can pray it online. Please let us know you did. But say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for forgiving me of my sins through the gift of your Son, Jesus, at Calvary. Thank you for raising him on Easter Day that through him I might live by the power of your Holy Spirit. And though I don't understand it all, I commit my life to you and I want to leave a legacy of faith in my posterity. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Can we give him one more hand of praise this morning? Hallelujah. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. I love you. May the Father who forgave us of all of our sins, may the Father who gave us all a fresh start in life, may the Father dip our feet in oil, anoint our heads with oil, bathe our souls in oil, and may we go out of here with hands dripping with the anointing of the Holy Spirit to bring blessings to other people in life. Go in peace in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you.